Okay, so welcome again. Um, my name is Chrissy. I'm the director for the Friends of Neat Tarts Bay Webs, um, which you which you all know is abbreviated to um, or stands for Watershed Estuary Beach and Sea. Um, we, for those of you that are less familiar with us, we work to sustain the Neat Bay area through education and stewardship. Uh, so we fundraise through grants and private donations to support uh, various different hands-on STEM-based programs for K through 12 students, as well as to bring different learning opportunities into the community so people can learn about this unique place and ecosystem. Um, whether they live here, visit here, um, work here, we want to provide opportunities for people to really engage with this special place um, and learn about why it's so important to conserve it and protect it. Um, we also want to give opportunities for people to really invest, um, to give back. So we encourage and try and find ways to connect people with community science projects. Um, and we also offer things like this where we're trying to help put a little more information in the hands of our volunteers so that they can use that information when they go out um, in to the natural environment as part of our programs, uh, a partnering organizations programs, um, or just as they're out there venturing and chatting with people. Uh, we're really lucky to have Jim Young as part of our team. Jim's been a longtime board member. Um, he is a retired marine biologist um, and has spent many, um, many years here in Neatarts doing his own research even after he retired and also cataloging the great um, number of plants and animals uh, that are um, found in this magical place. So tonight, so today, not tonight, not quite tonight, <laughs> this afternoon, <laughs> Jim's going to dive a little deeper for us um, and talk to us about uh, how Neatars Bay formed and the various different habitats you'd find in the bay. Um, if, if you, some of you I know joined our previous deeper dive, which focused on intertidal animals, um, there will be a little bit of overlap, but mostly um, what Jim's going to go into today are things that you can find actually in Neatars Bay and not necessarily in the intertidal zone. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing and hand it over to Jim to take over for the rest of the time. Um, I will kind of just say that uh, there, oh, you got it, Jim? Um, I'm trying to find yeah, I think I do. I see you. Okay. <laughs> Looking for that green square at the bottom. Yeah. And uh, gotta get my PowerPoint thing up there. Okay. Can you see the uh, PowerPoint slides? Not yet. You haven't quite shared the screen yet, Jim. I haven't. Oh, I thought mm -hmm. I did. Okay. We'll do it again. Screen. There we go. So why Jim's doing this, um, we will give you a break. It's a long, it's a long uh, presentation. So we're definitely do a break somewhere around mollusks is our plan. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. And uh, we're, we're take a couple short breaks to just to allow for some questions. But if you have a question that pops up while Jim's presenting, just go ahead and type it in the chat. And then that way we got your question recorded and we can we can toss it to Jim at a good at a good moment in time to have him answer it. Okay, I'm gonna turn off my camera and let you take over, Jim. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, can you? All, I hope you can all see my uh, PowerPoint uh, screen. The one that says Oregon Estuaries, Neatarts Bay. Looks and, great, Jim. Uh, okay, great, good. So what we're going to talk about today is this is going to be kind of a long presentation, I'm afraid, because there's just a lot to know about the bay. Uh, first, we'll talk about the geology and kind of the topography of the bay. And I would tell you that the bay is what's called a biome. It's kind of, and a biome is a kind of a major ecological area like a, a desert or a forest or a grassland. And then the, the bay has various habitats, and we'll talk about those. And then we're going to go into the biology of the bay. So my first slide here, let's get there's something, a few facts about the bay. Um, the bay is actually part of a what's called a littoral or littoral 
cell, which is, and that means that it's a section of the coastline that's bounded by two projecting headlands. In our case, it's uh, Cape Mears and Cape Lookout. And there's lateral wa water movement, and sand movement, that's kind of conf confined between those two headlands. And actually along the Oregon coast, there are uh, 22 discrete um, littoral cells. Now, the bays formed by a combination of tectonic subsidence, which means every time there's a big earthquake, it sinks. And for, it's also caused by erosion, differential erosion. So when there's a, a big earthquake in, in the past uh, 3,000 years, we've had four major quakes. And usually on the interval of uh, between four and 600 years, and we're due for another one. And when that happens, uh, the bay sinks. Uh, actually sometimes for several feet. So let's, we'll go I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, the bay is about five miles long. It's a mile and a half wide. It's about 2,325 acres. It's Oregon's seventh largest bay, um, fairly small bay. Watershed is even small, is very small. It's about 13 square miles. There are no rivers emptying in the bay. So, which means that the, uh, the bay is uh, very saline. It's not diluted by fresh water. Except there's about 16 small creeks uh, that flow into the bay and they are small. And the largest is Whiskey Creek by the fish hatchery. And that actually has, a, it's the one creek that has a salmon run in it. Uh, so Neatarts Bay is mostly saline and uh, there are semi diurnal tides, which means there's that flush out, out the, the water in the bay if, between 40 and 90%. Semi diurnal means that there are, are two highs and two lows every day. And there's a high high and a low high and a high low and a low low. So there, there's variations in the, the tide. And that the um, range of the tide depends on how, how much water is flushed from the bay. Okay, tectonic subsidence. And we can actually see how that happened, or the results of it. You walk along around Happy Camp and uh, right below the Terry Moore Motel and also other places along the eastern edge of the bay, you can see these old stumps, old tree roots that were once forest. And so when the bay subsided, those sunk and the incoming saltwater killed them. And so we have these ghost forests along the Oregon coast. And this, this is our ghost forest for all we have its root sections, but they're still there. And some of these, not necessarily in this bay, but along the Oregon coast, some of these have been dated back to the year 300. So a few thousand, a couple thousand years old almost. And then we have erosion. We have rip currents. And so when waves come into the uh, shoreline and they build up and then the water has to go back out. So they, uh, pick the easiest route, you, the water picks the easiest route, and that causes a rip current, which you don't want to get caught in if you're out swimming. Uh, then there's onshore cur currents. So they uh, are caused by incoming waves. And all, all waves, except for um, tsunamis or landslide slide caused waves, are the result of wind, wind movement. So um, all the waves are generated by wind that we see on our, so on more windy days, there'll be bigger waves on calm days, so, uh, shorter waves. 
And then there's long short currents that move up and down the, up and down the beach. So how does that affect Neetarts Bay? Well, as I said, the waves are created by wind. And there's a tendency for sand to move offshore in the summer and onshore in the winter. Now, these are just tendencies. It's not, uh, doesn't happen that all, all the time, but uh, a good, on the average, that's the way it works. And in summer winds come from the north, they produce uh, long short currents that head south, pushing south, pushing sand southward. And then the winter winds come from the south and they push uh, sand northwards. And so, you, you know, when you go, in the beach, go to the beach in the summertime, uh, the wind is typically coming from the north. When you're here on the beach in the wintertime, it's coming from the south. And the winter winds is, are typically stronger than the summer winds, so there's a net movement of sand northward. And actually, El Nino's can amplify this uh, effect. So there can be uh, waves coming in from the south, southwest in the wintertime, pushing sand northward, waves coming in from the northwest, pushing sand southward. But the winter waves uh, kind of over take the uh, sand, sand movement, pushing it northward. Uh, and the, the result of this is really is that there's a, a net movement of sand north. And that's what caused the, uh, the spit to form on Metartarts Bay. And there's also some beach accretion, accretion along the insides of spits sometimes. This is typical but not necessarily a, a rule the whole time, uh, constantly. It's, a, it's just a, on average, that's the way it happens. So, oops, erosion. You can see some, this was taken, I think about 2005. Uh, that was a landslide at, at Cape Lookout. Uh, a good portion of the uh, hillside fell off. Um, a lot of that sand and rock uh, moved northward, outward, and then northward. And take, Cape Lookout State Park has had a history of erosion, <laughs> and it's still eroding. Uh, years ago, they tried to alleviate some of that eroding by uh, building berms made out of these cloth bags that were uh, filled with sand and stacked on one another, and then they would uh, covered with sand and planted with uh, native uh, dune grass and held back, held erosion back for a bit. But right now, this is the way it looks. All the, all those uh, berms are eroding away and leaving all these bags on the beach. And you can see the results of erosion along uh, Cape Mare's, uh, I mean, Cape Lookout uh, Park here, uh, where the uh, these trees were once standing, now they're just uh, becoming ghost trees. And so the result is that uh, the erosion near the base of the spit has gradually um, increased the northern, northern end of the spit and deposited all this sand here out on the sand flat right near the mouth of the bay. Here's a couple more pictures of erosion. This was uh, right below the capes during a very high tide. Um, there used to be a barrier dune out there and that got pretty much washed away. It came looking like this. And some of you right, might remember years ago when the, uh, uh, the base of the cliff that holding up the Edgewater Motel and it fell in. Um, you see their sewer pipes on the, uh, the fallen down on the beach and all this sand has eroded away. They had to do some uh, reinforcement with uh, concrete there. So there's a constant erosion taking place, especially at the south end of the uh, littoral cell. Okay, the watershed, it's 13 square miles. Um, 
extends from just above Happy Camp, almost up on the eastern or eastern ocean side, down to uh, Cape Lookout. And if I superimpose this over on the the uh, satellite map, you can see where it goes, covers. So even Cape Lookout is not part of the, the uh, watershed. Okay, habitats. What do we mean by habitats? These are areas in the bay where different have different, uh, in this case, uh, sediment or bottom conditions. And one of them would be the sand flats. And you can all see my cursor, I hope. Uh, that's an example of sand flat there, sand flat sod here, some others in the bay, mostly sandy. That's a, a fairly high energy area where there's a lot of water movement over the top of the uh, sand, so it gets mixed a bit. There's some things that live there, not, not as many things as there are in more stable habitats. Uh, eelgrass flats, and uh, I'm not gonna say a whole lot about eelgrass, but there's an eelgrass flat here. There's some up along the edge of the bay, on, on the eastern edge of the bay, and various, uh, various places in the bay. Mud flats, these are the uh, areas where the sediments are a lot finer than the sand. They include uh, silts and clays. And if you walk out there, you'll probably sink up to your kneecaps. And a lot of things live in the mud flats. They're a lot more stable and uh, areas in the, uh, the sand flats. And they also include some of the eelgrass eel flats. Cobble flats, there's a few of them in the bay. There's one right at the base of uh, knee tarts, right uh, just opposite the uh, Terry Moore Motel. And it's where a lot of people go clamming. Uh, big, there's uh, boulders and cobbles in there. There's another one right near the New Tarts Bay and Marina. And there's certain, a lot, a lot of critters that live in this cobbled area because it's, uh, it's a fairly stable area. Riprap, uh, which are the, is an artificial habitat uh, created by uh, rocks and boulders that, um, or basalt boulders that were uh, placed along the eastern edge of the bay to create uh, the, the Neitarts Bay Road, and they're they're good. Uh, they're they're pretty stable habitat also. So there's a lot of critters that live there, and lots of uh, places for critters to hide. The salt marsh, um, which is a habitat in its own. There's a several salt marshes. Uh, there's one at the base of the bay. There's some along the inside of the spit, uh, some pocket marshes along the uh, uh, eastern side of the bay. And these have their own uh, uh, fauna and flora. It's quite different from every, every place else. And uh, some of you may have uh, seen the presentation last week on, that I did on uh, salt marsh. And, wishing you could have actually gone out and seen it. And then we have subtitle. These are areas that are never exposed at low tide. So there's some of the, and as we go through these animals or animals and plants that live in the bay, I'll try and uh, mention which kind of habitat they live in, where you'll find them. Let's see, sediments. Uh, what I'm gonna say about sediments besides uh, what I've just said is that uh, if you dig down, especially those of you who have gone clamming probably notice this, that uh, as you dig down, the sediments uh, begin to smell like rotten eggs. And <laughs> they turn black. Taken last week's, uh, seen last week's presentation, I talked about that. and. This black area is what's called the sulfide layer. And it's caused by, um, it's, 
it's an, first of all, it's a, an area that has no oxygen in it. Uh, in a sand fl flat where there's a lot of uh, sand turnover, uh, you can see there's there's no black at the top. This is, these were some, uh, I did this with a, a, a clam gun, <laughs> took these scores. And you, but if you go into the eelgrass beds where there's not much uh, sand turnover, uh, it's pretty black right underneath the surface. And that's because these, this black area is fairly anaerobic, doesn't have any oxygen in it. And there's certain bacteria called um, sulfide bacteria that uh, reduce, they live on uh, sulfates that are in the water and reduce those to hydrogen sulfide, which is the chemical that makes it smell like rotten eggs. And then uh, that hydrogen sulfide actually uh, reacts with iron, iron sulfide, because there's a lot of iron in these sediments, and it turns them, it, it turns the iron into uh, iron sulfide, which is, turns it black. So, okay, the biology of the bay. We're going to talk about plants and seaweeds. Now, uh, the green, there's three types of main uh, types of seaweeds. There's the greens, the reds, and the browns. The greens are actually in the plant kingdom. Uh, the browns are in their own kingdom called chromista. And we'll talk about, and the eelgrass I'm not going to talk too much about because uh, I'm going to I'm going to tell you about uh, where to go with Tony D'Andrea's presentation on eelgrass, which is on our website, and uh, or and you can which can be reached by the, our website. And it's it's an excellent uh, presentation on eelgrass. The animals I talk mostly about invertebrates. Um, and there's several ways of classifying them, uh, either through their uh, genetic, genetic uh, relationships uh, or where they live. Uh, say their uh, in fauna means they're living down in the sediment. If they're epifauna, they'd be living on top of the sediment, above it. Uh, some are intertidal, some are sub subtidal. And some of the animals are actually terrestrial. And then there's others that are marine. I'm not going to say too much about terrestrial ones, but there are a few. Okay, the eelgrass. We have two types of eelgrass in the bay. Um, there's our native eelgrass, which has a, a wide, long blade. And there's a, an import or Japanese eelgrass, which is called the dwarf eelgrass. It has little narrow blades that are only a few inches long. And they kind of live together, but they kind of live apart. Um, the Japanese eelgrass lives at a higher uh, topographic uh, level. In other words, higher up in the, uh, the bay, the shallower parts of the bay than the uh, native eelgrass. And, but our, our bay is pretty flat. So when you talk about uh, these mud flats and sand flats and eelgrass flats, um, they're all pretty level. And the difference in heights where these uh, eelgrass, uh, different eelgrass beds will uh, occur can be a, diff yeah, a difference of maybe one or two inches. So, if you get into a puddle like this, um, it's about two inches deeper than the uh, the, the neighboring uh, mound here, say like in this photograph, where the Japanese eelgrass is. It can be uh, only a few inches difference. And that's about all I'm gonna say about eelgrass. <laughs> okay, so look at, uh, T Dr. Uh, Tony D'Andreas uh, from uh, 
Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife, and also uh, he was a professor at OSU. And he gave a excellent presentation on eelgrass, which is online. Okay, seaweeds. We've got all kinds of seaweeds. Uh, most of which I'm not going to mention because there are many, many of them. Um, here's a, these are pictures of the ones I am going to mention. Let me say something about the life history of the seaweed. So um, there can be plants that are, I'm going to, I'm going to call all of these plants because they, <laughs> historically they were all put in the plant kingdom. So they, there are two types of uh, seaweeds. There's the spor sporophyte and the gametophyte. These are two, two generations of a species of seaweed. And so sporophytes uh, make spores, gametophytes make gametes. And this is not only in seaweeds, but uh, a lot of the lower plants like ferns and mosses and so on also have sporophytes and gametophytes. If you're in a forest and you see a lot where there's lots of, for, sp uh, excuse me, well, you're in a forest where there's lots of uh, ferns, those are all sporophytes. They are, the gametophyte uh, generation is some kind of a little thing you'll hardly ever notice. It's just a little tiny piece of plant separate from the sporophyte. Okay, now, the, uh, in some seaweeds, the sporophyte looks a lot different from the, from the gametoph gametophyte. These are called heteromorphic. Uh, for example, the bull kelp, these are all sporophytes that you see. You don't see the uh, gametophyte hardly ever. The sea lettuce, is isomorphic. In other words, the two generations look exactly alike. The only way you can tell the difference is act, actually look at the reproductive structures under a microscope. Okay. Um, when you talk about seaweeds, we have these three basic parts. There's the blade in the seaweed, a little stem-like st structure called a stipe, uh, some of them have stipes, some of them don't. And there's a hold fast, which looks like a root, but it's not a root because it, it doesn't absorb nutrients like a tree root does. Uh, it's just uh, an anchor. Okay, the green algae. You find most of this around, a lot of the green algae you find around the uh, cobble habitats and, and nearby sand habitats, like um, right down in front of the Terry Moore Motel. It's a good, uh, good beds of uh, green seaweeds, something like this. So we have three common types. Uh, there's a sea hare or gutweed. Uh, this is all the intestinalis, they call it intestinalis because it's hollow like an intestine. So a lot of times it'll float because it has a little air black, uh, air caught inside these tubes. There's a ribbon weed, and actually two types. We have uh, uh, Ovalenza and uh, Ova taniata. Taniata, yeah. Um, but they're both ribbon-like. And then there's the sea lettuce. The big, and this type of sea lettuce, the one we have here, is uh, usually has uh, holes in it, in the blade. It used to be uh, called all the uh, perforata. <laughs> and then they changed the name. Then we have the sugar kelp, which is a, a big bladed uh, seaweed. It's a brown. Uh, sugar kelp, uh, the, young one, the young blades look like this with these little indentations in them. Um, older ones are kind of flat and thicker. This is actually, um, grown commercially in some pla places, uh, both in the United States and other parts of the world. And it's used for um, all the algins and 
uh, chemicals in the, in the seaweed that uh, can be put into things like ice cream, thickeners, or cosmetics, uh, all kinds of things it's used for. We have a Japanese invasive seaweed, brown, a sea, brown seaweed, this, uh, right near the mouth of Meteorites Bay off Happy Camp from, you'll see it from about the uh, boat launch all the way up to, or almost to the mouth of the bay. And it's pretty much on the eastern side of the bay. And it's an annual plant. It disappears in the wintertime. And you'll see thick beds of it in the summertime. So it's a, it's a sargassum. You've probably heard of sargassum from the Sarga, Sargasso Sea in the, in the Atlantic. It's a, it's a similar type of species. Rockweed, um, you'll see, and this grows on rocks, and you'll see this around, especially, ar especially around the uh, rip ramp, uh, around the boat ramp, um, along the eastern shore of the, the bay. And these structures, these little air bladders on the uh, end of the, uh, these blades are reproductive structures. Now, this is the one one of the few seaweeds that doesn't have a spore fight generation. These little structures, these structures produce gametes. We have the acid kelp, which is common both in the rocky intertidal zone, out where we uh, talked about last year, and inside the bay, especially around um, the cobble area. This is uh, an interesting seaweed in that it produces sulfuric acid. And if you're ever collecting seaweeds, if you mix this one in with your collection, all your seaweed and collected seaweeds will be dissolved <laughs> after a few hours. And if you're collecting invertebrates and put the seaweed in with the invertebrates, eventually it'll kill them all. I'm getting, excuse me, I, my phone was pinging with um, messages from Marcus from Tillamook County, Kayak Tillamook County. Okay, seagrass la laver. This is a, uh, an epiphyte, which means it's uh, growing on another plant, getting some of its nutrients from that, that other plant. And that other plant happens, happens to be eelgrass. So, and it will also grow on rock grass, which is out on the rocky intertidal area. There are various red seaweeds. Uh, this is one you'll, um, the black line seaweed you'll find, especially washed up on the shore. Uh, another one that uh, you'll see a lot of is the Turkish towel. Um, it has all these little bumps on them. Some of them are reproductive some structures, some of them are not. And these are big blades and they're rough like a towel. Okay, iridescent seaweed, um, the rainbow leaf. It has a kind of a waxy cuticle on it. Um, and when light penetrates this cuticle, it bounces off of the uh, inside of that, the bottom of the side of that cuticle and the top side, and depending on the thickness of the cuticle and the colors are uh, caused by the various uh, wavelengths that are going through the cuticle. So in this case, mostly it's, it's blue. And I had to show you this because um, you know, it's all on our website, on the Neatarts page today, today website. And it's amazing that people overseas actually read this. So I got a, a uh, request some years ago by a museum in Australia that were doing a book on iridescence. And they asked if I could 
if they could have a copy of that sea seaweed. So I said, yes, sure. And sent them a, a copy of it and said, would you, you know, please uh, send me a copy of the book when it's published. Well, about two years went by and I kind of forgot all about it. And then one day in the mail came the book. And there's our picture of the seaweed in the book. There's some filamentous uh, seaweeds. This one uh, is called poly, polysophonia. And you'll see it, especially around the, the um, cobbled area. And looking at microscopes, uh, you see all these little filaments are com composed of cells that are kind of long stick shaped barrel sh or barrel shaped uh, cells. And then there's some red algaes that um, secrete calcium. Uh, these are the crustone, crustose coral algaes. And that's why you go out and pick up some of these rocks in the intertidal zone and they're pink colored because they're covered with this algae. Another red algae is the spaghetti, uh, sea spaghetti. Uh, most of us, this um, species is called Gracilaria. There's another one called Gracilaria opsis. It's very similar. I think most of ours is Gracilaria. In fact, I was uh, working with a woman named Gail Hansen this summer, who is the seaweed expert for Oregon. She's down in Newport, and she was coming up here um, hunting for a couple of different seaweeds. One of them was grass filaria, and she actually they, she sent that off to a colleague in Korea, South Korea, who did a, ge a genetic uh, sequence on this algae just to make sure it would, which uh, species it was, and. So we do, we do know the species names and we're certain of it. <laughs> okay, invertebrate animals. That's all. Any questions on seaweeds? Any Can questions we do on, it? on the topography of the bay too? We do have a couple questions. Um, and one is, are the thick sargassum seaweed beds crowding out native species or doing no harm? It doesn't look like it's doing any harm, from what I can tell. Okay. Uh, we still have the other uh, seaweeds, right? Uh, there's a quite a diversity of seaweeds right in, in among the uh, the sargassum. It, um, okay. Um, I know it's invasive, but it sure is a pretty one. <laughs> it is a pretty one. Um, <laughs> Uh, the other question was, can you review the watershed boundary again, please? And what is the eastern, most eastern boundary? And I'll add to that, I'll put a, a link in um, to uh, something that goes over watersheds that we have done previously. It's about two minutes or so long. It's not a very long video, but it just kind of goes over watersheds briefly. So I'll just, I'll put that in the chat for anybody who's interested, and then I'll let you answer, Jim. Okay, let's see if I can get back to that. Uh... I'm going to go move back to that uh, slide. Okay. Now the, the eastern edge is right at the ridge tops of these mountains that are border between Neetarts Bay and Tillamook, uh, the Tillamook um, lowlands, um, say like uh, South Prairie and, uh, and Tillamook itself. So we have a, a small range of hills here. And uh, let's see, I don't even know the names of the, there's, or if, if there are names for these hills or mountains. Uh, let's see, Cape Lookout, Cape Lookout uh, is the highest point 
in this range, I would say, I would guess, if you want to call it a range of mountains. Um, they were just high points. So it's just, I'm not quite sure how to answer that. <laughs> I can't tell you what, if there's any names to the boundaries. But say the question again. Right. Chrissy? Review. Yep, sorry, I forgot to unmute. <laughs> um, can you review the watershed boundary again? And what is the most eastern boundary? So I think it's just generally what's the east most eastern boundary. And so I would say down um, down near that Cape Look Cape Lookout area right there, where you have kind of the hook right at the bottom. Um, right. That's yeah, right there. That's where the Whiskey Creek sub watershed is, and it okay. flows down through there. Johnson Creek comes in around there too. And then on the other side of that is the start of the Tillamook River. You know, the, all of the little tributaries yeah. that start to flow into the Tillamook River. So yeah, Tillamook that's River, on this side. Right. Uh, on the others, on the on the right, on the, right. the western be, or the eastern be, side. Yeah, they'll be flowing uh, towards the east. There's like a, a Fawcett Creek, um, Dewey Creek. Um, one of the other, a few others in there that uh, flow from from this these ridge points uh, towards Tillamook River. And let's see. Okay. I'll add one more uh, little uh, bit if you don't mind, yeah. Jim. Sure. Uh, so the other thing to remember is that when you're defining a watershed, there are different size watersheds. So Neatart is considered a prefrontal coastal watershed which is pretty small, but you can, there's something called a huck, which is kind of a term that really doesn't make much sense to, to a lot of people. But if you, it depends on the size of the huck you're looking at, um, whether or not knee tarts would be part of the Nestucca Sand Lake watershed or whether it be its own watershed. So you kind of have to kind of think about it. Jim's got to scale down to the smallest prefrontal watershed right now, which is what we usually talk about when we talk about it being just 13 square miles. So you might read something somewhere else that says that this watershed's bigger, but that's because there's lots of different ways to define how big your watershed's going to be or how small your watershed's going to be. Well, also all third, all, uh, all these creeks, uh, what I say? Uh, oh. However many of them there are 13 or whatever it is. All, all fl flow uh, from the eastern edge of this watershed towards Neatarts Bay. Yep, that's the most immediate watershed around us for sure. Right. I think it was 16, you said, Jim. Did I say 16? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, one of them used to be Johnson Creek, which uh, now that was originally. It, flowed into the ocean, then it was diverted to flow into the salt marsh, and then recently it's been diverted back to its original course. And that was right at the south end of the uh, watershed. Okay, any, any other questions? Chrissy? Any I don't other? see any. I don't see any more questions coming in. Anybody who has um, questions can mm -hmm. type them in the chat. I don't see them even scanning. Okay, I gotta go right back. now. I Ooh. don't don't see any more. All right. Okay. So when I uh, started uh, this uh, putting this together, I wasn't quite sure how to whether to classify the animals by their habitat or phylogenetically. And I've chosen to do it uh, pretty much phylogenetically. So we're gonna talk about uh, uh, sea anemones and hydroids and jellies and worms and so on, all these different classifications separately, but I will tell you where they're formed. I mean, where you, where you find them. Um, so we're gonna start with the, the Cnidarians. That includes sea anemones, hydroids, and jellyfish, or jellies. 
Okay, there's a Nidarian. And when, I'm not gonna go all, over all of them. Just a, these are some of them that you find in Neetarts Bay and they're fairly common or they have something uh, interesting about them. Uh, one is the uh, plum, plumose uh, anemone, which is a very common anemone uh, throughout the West Coast. Um, there are actually two different species of the metridium. Uh, this is the shallow water one, and then there's a, a large, deeper one. Uh, this, this you can find uh, especially right around the, the boat launch, Neetarts Bay. Uh, when it's low tide, there's these kind of gelatinous blobs that are hanging down uh, attached to the rocks. And then when tide comes in, this is what they look like with all their little tentacles spread out. Now, remember la last year I talked about uh, the, stinging, the stinging cells and so on, the uh, jellyfish and anemones and so on. We're not going to go into that now. Um, but these are some you'll find. Another one, another, another two actually, uh, are the same genus. One is the stubby rose anemone. And I found this one numerous times around the, the cobbled area. And there, it's, it's, this thing is about, oh, maybe uh, five, six inches across. And the tentacles have a two-tone, kind of a dark center and a lighter uh, tip and base, and it is actually attached to a buried rock or shell. So it's uh, partially buried. Um, the painted anemone, which is more subtitle, um, it's, it's painted because the, the column of the, this beast is uh, painted uh, with stripes of red and then kind of a stripes of a, a army drab. And it's, this column is attached to exposed rocks. <laughs> and we have another one called the spotted, white spotted anemone. And I found this one in the Rocky Inner title, I mean, not Rocky Inner, uh, cobbled area. And it has these white spots on the side. It's all, they're all the same. Uh, genus Euterocena, and this one, <laughs> it, nobody, nobody's quite sure what the uh, species name of this is. It's given, been given all kinds of species names, and uh, it, it isn't really settled on what the uh, species name it is. So uh, <clears throat> there's a biologist up at uh, uh, University of Washington who reviewed uh, my sea anemones for me and said this one, he did, and he wrote a book on um, called uh, Beneath Pacific Tides. Right? And he says on this one, he's just put species because he doesn't know what the species is. And maybe it hasn't even actually been described. Okay, worms. Um, there's a little worm, worm cartoon. And we have most of the worms we're gonna, we see are what are called polychaetes, uh, segmented worms. Uh, they're kind of the marine variety of the earthworm. Um, they can be all kinds of different sizes. Um, this one here on the left uh, is found mostly in the uh, mud flats around, uh, I found it mostly around um, the mud flats around the uh, salt marsh area. And this one on the right, is, you can find out in the sandy areas when you're, where you're uh, digging clams. And this, this one, uh, the one on the left is only about uh, maybe an inch long, maybe an inch and a half. Uh, this one can be as big around as your finger. Those were uh, Claire Thomas's fingers, and it can be oh a foot and a half long maybe, and also it can bite. It has jaws. Okay, these are the holes from the uh, 
this uh, mud dwelling uh, worm. Okay, here's a, one called a sand worm. It's about, oh, it can be maybe uh, three or four inches or five inches long. And it has a proboscis that looks like this, that'll extend. And we have a, uh, there's another worm called the fringed hood worm, hood worm, spaghetti worm. And it has this uh, tube that it lives in that it secretes. It's kind of a rubbery looking substance that contains also, it contains sand and it has these little fringes on it. And it li lives inside this tube. I got some notes on that someplace here. And get down to it. Okay. Hold on a second. Okay, this this uh, feeds by uh, capturing detritus with uh, some little tentacles that uh, are on this end. This is the worm that I pulled out of the tube. And the hood is oriented with the uh, current, uh, prevailing current, so that the, uh, the head of the worm is more exposed to the uh, uh, detritus that um, floats by. It's a detrital feeder. Detritus is just a um, kind of uh, de decomposed organic material, little particles. And that, so, and I, I suppose this offers some protection to the uh, to the head of the worm too. Okay, there's a now on the rocky intertidal area, the the riprap areas along the edge of the bay and in the cobbled areas will be the red trumpet worm, which is, has a calcareous tube that it uh, secretes. And so you'll see. In fact, if I go back to this. Slide back here. You can see one of these calcareous tubes right here. Huh. So it's called the red trumpet worm because these are the gills. And when they're exposed I mean, underwater, they have these little feathery look, looking things that uh, capture food. And a device called an operculum, which is like a door. So when it sucks in its gills into its inside the tube, this uh, trumpet-shaped thing uh, closes off the end of the tube, protect protect the gills. Uh, so also, this is a kind of a curious worm in that it had its blood is a pigment called chlorocurorin, which uh, when it's oxygenated, it's bright green. It's one of a couple, only a few worms that have that. Whereas our blood is red, it has, it's, it's, it's green blood. We have another worm that's uh, in the bay that's, well, it's common in certain parts of the bay called the lug worm and it feeds on sand grains that it kind of ingest, and any it'll pick out organic matter uh, or any or organisms that are attached to sand grains, like little nematodes or protozoans, and ingests and then ingests the sand that after digesting the. Uh, uh, anything living on the sand grains, it will expel them. So you see all these little, little sand, uh, curly cues of sand grains around where the, the worm lives. Now, when you're out digging clams, um, almost invariably, you'll run into these long, long, stringy looking red things called a sludge worm. They can be maybe a foot. Um, foot and a half or even longer and with a diameter of a, uh, smaller than a pencil pencil lead and 
It's called the le- thread le- uh, sludge worm. And let's see, let's, it's also a sediment ingester. And it will, in fact, you can see some of the sediment inside the, uh, the gut of this. And it'll uh, digest anything, anything that's living on the sand grains, bacteria, whatever. Now, um, there's another one that is very common when you're digging gaper clams around the uh, uh, cobbled area just uh, below the terry moor. And this is the iridescent, iridescent zone worm. And it also has a cuticle uh, that iridesces. And so you can see kind of the, the various colors in the cuticle. And this thing is about uh, maybe six inches long or so. So these are, those are kind of look, common polychaetes you'll see in, in the bay. And I know you're not gonna remember all these right away. You have to go out there and take a look. Uh, take a guide like this uh, with you or um, bring them back and try to identify them. And eventually you'll learn them all. Uh, this is this is a, another type of worm called a, a Nemertian and it's not a segmented worm. Uh, and I'm only going to talk about one species of this as the purple ribbon worm or the wanderer. And it's fairly common in the bay and it has has a uh, dark side on the upper side and kind of a tan side on the on its ventral side. And when tide goes out, it'll come out of its burrow and it follows any trails uh, left by uh, one of the uh, Species, any species of nereus. And when it, so it, it's hunting these nereus worms, like that little tiny one that I showed you that was in the uh, mud flats that made those little holes. And when it, it has a peculiar way of uh, catching its prey. So this, uh, this guy's a, a hunter. And it's, a, he's out hunting these uh, segmented worms. And in its anterior end, it's armed with a poisonous dart, a stylet, that, that will eject and stab and paralyze its prey. And then it feeds on it by just in, ingesting the prey whole. And the poison, which it's not going to hurt you because it's a uh, it's little uh, spear, it's a stylus is pretty small, but it has a neurotoxin called tr- tr- tetrodotoxin, which is actually the same toxin that's found, uh, we can f- find in the rough skin newts that we find in our uh, woods here. Uh, that's a toxin in their skin. It's also the same toxin that's in the uh, puffer fish, which are poison, can be poisonous if, if you eat them. And in Australia, the blue ring octopus has the same tetrodotoxin. But I picked them up and I'm still here. Okay. I think we're about due for a break. Any questions on what we covered so far? There is a question. Um, There is a question about algaes, actually. And so if anybody has a question about worms, please do plop it in the chat there. Um, Cleaned a couple, cleared a couple things up for me, Jim. So that was, that was good. Um, So um, Donna asked, how, how long of a lifespan do some of the seaweeds have? What seaweeds do I see people harvesting at low tide? Okay. Um, a lot of the seaweeds are annual. So it's just like an annual plant. Um, so they'll be there in the summertime. Um, and then you won't see them in the wintertime. 
Now there are a few that are perennials. They may have lived uh, um, several years. I don't know. Uh, some of them that grow in the upper upper intertidal in the rocky intertidal zone are. Uh, I don't know exactly how long their lifespan is, but like the bull kelp, um, the sargassum that we see, um, and the acid kilt and a lot of these others are annual plants. And let's see, the ones that are harvested, actually uh, the sea lettuce is probably one of them that's uh, harvested locally mostly. Um, a lot of the Asians will uh, come down to uh, Happy Camp and go over to the uh, uh, Kabul area and harvest the uh, uh, sea lettuce. And I asked them how they prepare it and one of them said they deep fat fry it and make it crispy. So I, I took some home one time and tried it. And yes, it was nice and crispy and flavorful. And then you can also put them in salads. Most of the seaweeds are edible. Uh, I wouldn't eat the acid kill. Um, you can taste it and it tastes kind of sour because it has the acid in it. Um, and then the others have, some of the others have hard structures that just can't, you can't digest. Or, so. Any, yeah, I hope that answers which, the question. Yeah, which which ones uh, which ones would you avoid because of the hard structures? Uh, any of the coral analogies, um, the rockweed, you could eat, probably eat the uh, the those uh, bladder tips or would be okay, but um, the rest of them is kind of hard and tough. It's not going to hurt you, but. Uh, and there's a few others that are I'm trying to think of what others uh, would uh, have hard structures. Most of them are okay. Uh, some of them might be a little tough. Um, the let's see the some of the browns are kind of thick, chewy. They would be better in, as a flavoring and soup rather than just eating them. And I think uh, the, <clears throat> the a lot of the browns, the laminarians, which uh, include a lot of the big uh, leafy browns, uh, the Japanese refer to them as kombu and they're used in soups. So let's see. But some of the hearts, the, the stems or the stipes, I, you really couldn't, couldn't eat because they're just uh, they're not that they're poisonous. They're just too woody. I hope I didn't answer that question. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, so how long does everyone feel? Um, 10 minute break and come back. What's your suggestion, Jim? Oh, how long have we gone so far? We're at 3.40, so we've gone just over an hour. Okay. Um, actually, we probably have less than an hour to go. Um, okay. So we can take a bathroom break. <laughs> okay, so how about we shoot for 10 minutes, if that sounds good okay. to everybody. And we will, um, we will start back up right around 3.50, 3.51. All right. Jim. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no, it's my no. father. <laughs> um, well, you didn't miss too much, I guess. Two, two clams. <laughs> okay. Uh, another common clam that people uh, like to collect is the uh, cockle. Nettles cockle, and you can tell it because it has these uh, not only the concentric uh, ridges, but these uh, radial ridges that uh, uh, go out from the hinge. So these very strong radial ridges. And this clam, is, you can sometimes actually find it on the surface. Uh, it's a very shallow uh, digging clam, uh, and people don't have to actually dig for them, they can rake for them use rakes. And a similar clam, 
in appearance, but not related, closely related, is the, uh, the little neck clam, the, the so-called steamer clam. And they're also very close to the surface. Uh, they're, so their bur burrows aren't very deep, maybe an inch or two. And they have uh, also radial ridges, but um, very narrow compared to the, uh, the, the cockle. And if, you're, if you're, you're going out digging for these, there are certain areas in the bay that uh, say um, off the, just north of the, northwest of the fish hatchery is a good uh, collecting ground for uh, little necks. And people would go out there with rakes and rake them up. A good way where you, a little more ecological, envir environmentally uh, uh, conscious way of uh, harvesting them is when you're out there, you can take, take your uh, shoes out and go, shoes off and then uh, go barefoot and you can feel them under your feet. So you, you don't have to rake anything, you just reach down and pick them up. Another, this is an, a, an introduced species called the dark mahogany clam or purple varnish clam. And it's from the uh, uh, Western Pacific of Japan, uh, it's an Asian clam. And it was in, introduced here in the back in the 19, early 1990s out of ballast water. And it's made its way up and down the coast uh, from British Columbia down through California. And it's actually a pretty good eating clam. It's small and very pretty clam. It's uh, not really, I don't think it's um, doing any damage to the environment. Um, it kind of comes and goes in areas in each art space. Some, I've some, found some patches where they're very plentiful and the next year they'll be pretty much gone um, from that area and you find them in another area. So another, another introduced species is called, is the soft shell clam. It's an East Coast clam. It's uh, was brought out here years ago. It's kind of long. These can, can be about uh, three inches long, two, two and a half, three inches long up to that. You can see one in my hand here, just the shell. And it had, uh, once see, they're pretty easy to recognize because of this kind of pointed, almost pointed shape here and rounded on the, uh, this is actually the anterior side. But it has what's called this little uh, back. When you take the shells apart, it has this little projection here called the chondrophore. And it's pretty characteristic of that clam. Oh, another one that kind of looks like it, and it's actually related to the, well, no, it isn't related to it, is the uh, talent. Talinid clam. Uh, these are fairly small. The uh, siphons are separate. The in intake one is down here. The ex excurrent uh, siphon is up here. Um, it's very common in the, in the bay. And man, this is the one that's related to it. The Macoma clams. Um, they're going to come in all different. Uh, this little probably about four or five different species out here in the bay. Uh, this one's the bent, bent nose clam. It's called bent nose because the shell kind of uh, curves off in, in the one direction. And then this is the white sand clam, which can be pretty good size. And, and you find these out in the bay. And <clears throat> I, I'm mentioning all these species because these are the ones people will dig up out there and they, they want, want to know what they are. Now, um, another type of clam that's, uh, or bivalve, is called the uh, rock jingle. And it's, a, it's actually has two shells or valves. And one of them is, uh, has a hole in it. 
and it clamps itself to the to rocks and you'll these look like almost like little oysters growing on the rocks and you'll these are very common at uh down by the uh, um, boat ramp uh and on the riprap around the edge of the bay they're about oh maybe maybe a couple inches across you can see a large small starfish uh nestled right in between them and underwater they have this kind of bright red mantle around the edge. And of course we have mussels. Uh, this, these are different from the uh, different species from the uh, mussels that you find out in the outer coast and the, on the rocky uh, areas uh, out near the surf. This is the bay mussel. The ones in the rocky areas have some radial ridges that are along the, <coughs> go from the hinge out to the edge of the shell. These only have these concentric uh, growth rings. These are the ones that, uh, if you ordered mussels in a restaurant, you're most likely to get. Uh, some of the uh, snails, um, probably the most common one in the bay is the dog winkle. And it's about uh, an inch and a half long. And it's a predator that will prey on clams and also other mollusks. And it has what's called a radula. It's a, it's a tongue-like organ that they use for uh, drilling holes in the shells of other mollusks. And then they insert a proboscis and suck out the insides. Um, this is another big clam, which was the moon snail. And we, those are common in the bay. They have a huge foot. This has a lot of liquid in it. Um, although it's considered good to eat. I've never eaten one myself, but uh, people, people do. Um, they have, they have, they lay their eggs in this kind of uh, gelatinous sand filled, what's called an egg collar. And you see the egg collar here next to the, uh, the moon snail. And these moon snails can be the shell. Let's see, here's a picture of the shell. It's about uh, six inches across. And the foot can be almost uh, uh, 12 inches in diameter or so. And they are predators also, and their fa favorite food is the butter clam. And you can always tell butter, the butter clams have been eaten by a moon snail because there's this uh, hole about the size of a, um, about the diameter of, of a pencil. And it has slope sides. And so the radula of this uh, snail has drilled that hole right there and then inserted its proboscis through, the, through this that opening and then sucked out the insides of the clam. Oh, and another little snail is a black turban snail. We find these um, in the cobble area right around the Neatarts Bay Marina. Pretty common right there and very common on the south side of Cape Lookout. And it's called black turban because the outside of the foot is colored black. And these mostly eat uh, vegetation like seaweeds and algaes. Very common uh, mollusk in the bay is the, the purple olive snail. And it's not only in the bay, but you find it on the sandy beaches. And if you see these tracks in the bay, these are made by olive snails, usually in the very sandy areas, not so much in the muddy areas. Let's see what I, I had some notes on what I want to say about that. The oh, by the way, yeah. Let, let me get to those. Okay, next page. Okay, this 
a snail is probably uh, omnivorous. In other words, it uh, eats both plants and animals. And the Indians used to use this, the coastal Indians especially, they used to use this as money to trade with inland Indians. So this was, uh, um, these shells were used as beads uh, for uh, body decoration by the uh, Indians, inland Indians. So these were worth money to Native Americans. Another mollusk are the, the, the periwinkles, the litterina. And this one we have here is the checkered periwinkle. Sometimes they're, they're checkered, sometimes they're not, but they are both the same species. Litterina scutulata. And then there's a, a rotted one and it has a very rough shell. And you tell this one because it has, always has a little white stripe on the inside of the shell right in the opening. And then, then we have the, the limpets, um, these little things that look like little hats, tents. Um, this is the Pacific Plate limpet, limpet. It has these uh, dark brown and white stripes along the edge of the shell. That's, this is the foot. This is the mouth. This is what's called the mantle area. It secretes the shell. And they also have a radula. And they use that for mainly for scraping uh, algae off rocks. And the dark color of radula is caused by incorporated iron, iron uh, molecules into the, uh, the radula teeth. And then there's one called the mask limpet, which has a lot of these radial grooves coming out from the apex of the shell. And if you hold the shell up to the light, on the anterior end, you'll see all these little translucent spots, thin shell, thin areas in the shell. I have no idea what the purpose of those are. Okay, then the nudibranchs, the sea slugs, which are always very beautiful. Uh, most of these are subtitle, except uh, the sea lemon is uh, intertidal. Uh, especially on the rocky outer coast, but you'll see it, you can find it in the bay also. Um, but sometimes you'll find these uh, intertidally also, especially this one, not so much this one. The white line, uh, or frosted nudibranch is, uh, has these frosted, uh, so I'm not sure what you call that structure, those structures, but um, they're found mostly subtitally, but they're common in the bay, along the riprap, along the edge of the bay, right near the bottom. So people who are scuba diving, who they'll find these a lot. And then we, in the uh, eelgrass, we have the eelgrass sea, sea hare. It's a it's not a nudibranch because it's uh, gills are not, nudibranch means uh, nude gills. So um, these are the gills of the sea lemon right here. And then on the anterior end are some little sensory structures, the little things that project from the uh, head of the, uh, look like little horns. These are called rhinophores. They uh, essentially, how the, that's how they smell. Uh, this one, the sea hare, has his gills tucked in a little pouch, so they're not naked. Uh, Nudibranch means naked gills. So, the, so this is not truly a nudibranch, but it is a sea slug. And then we have some Chitons in the bay, mainly this one called the mossy chiton. Um, chitons are a mollusk that don't have one shell, but they have eight plates, separate plates you know, like across the ship, across the uh, upper side of the body. And then they have this fringe around them uh, 
In this case, it looks like uh, moss has all these hairs on it. And find this one pretty common around the uh, uh, cobbled area right around the boat ramp. Not, not, not the boat, uh, the Neatarts Bay or Marina. I found this one quite a few times so out there. Okay, crustaceans. Our favorite crustacean, is, of course, is the crab around here. We'll talk about that one. But we'll start with the beach hoppers. And the most common beach hopper here is called the California beach hopper. And it has these um, kind of pinkish antenna. These can be up to about an inch long. They usually come out at night. Um, but in the daytime, they live in burrows. And you'll see that on a sand, these are in sandy beaches area, beach areas along the, um, right along Schooner Beach, all the way up to um, mouth of the bay, it's, they're common. Um, and usually in the kind of the upper intertidal area, um, they're, they don't require a lot of water. So, so when they dig this burrow, you see these uh, piles of sand, these on either side of the burrow. When they, when they dig, they'll dig a little bit and, and throw out the sand in one direction. And then they'll turn 180 degrees and then throw out the sand in the other direction, then turn around again, 180 degrees and keep going back and forth. So you see all these little burrows with all these uh, little sand uh, excavations on either side of the hole. And these holes can be up to about a, a foot deep. This is pretty close to a foot. I didn't have a ruler with me when I dug the, through, down the, through the sand, but uh, you can see they're pretty, they can go down quite a ways. The other thing about them is that uh, they will, sometimes go to war with each other. They're the uh, females are, are guarded by the, uh, the males. So when the females in the burrow, the males will often go to battle with each other uh, over the privilege of getting the female <laughs> and mating. So there'll be uh, Rivalry, rivalries between the males. Okay, the various shrimp we have in the bay. So, um, hey, Jim, can I interrupt for a second? Yeah, sure. Because you you segued right into crustaceans and we had a mollusk question. So, um, yeah. so uh, the question is that it was from Shelly. She said she saw a lot of moon snail egg collars in Puget Sound last week. And she asked oh. if this was a seasonal thing. And would we be seeing egg collars in our bay right now too? I presume it's seasonal. Um, I don't know if we'll see a lot of them in, in the bay right now. I wish I could answer that, but I'm not, I don't think I can. Um, the moon snails are not real common in the bay. They're occasional. Um, I don't know. You you have any feel for that, Chrissy? You go out there a lot. Or anybody? Yeah, I'm 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 open to hear what people will see and experience. I know that um, I know we see them um, a lot in May when we're out exploring and collecting for second grade day at the bay. We've seen the mm -hmm. collars out there at that time. Um, I know I've done some research on on them, and there's a, a little bit of a gap in the reproductive history, at least at least from what I was reading. But I I didn't dive into um, like scientific papers or anything. So if anybody else has any insights, I'd I'd love to hear from from you all yeah. too. Yeah, I, I wish I could answer that, but I I do. I, most of these mollusks ha do have a reproductive cycle where they're uh, fecund uh, different uh, at some point in the year, like usually the spring. Um, but 
not always. Um, I, uh, years ago, I did a master's thesis on reproduction in abalone. And they were capable of reproduction during most of the year. Okay. I have one more, one more yeah. question for you. Um, uh, what, what you had the mossy chitin up? Um, can you share the difference between hairy and mossy chitins? Oh, <laughs> or are they um, um, the same? <laughs> well, I'm not sure what. I think they are probably the same. <laughs> Could be. Let's see if I can. Uh, I might have to get back to you on that one. Okay. Fair yeah. enough. That's fair yeah. enough. Yeah. Because common names are kind of. Uh, they can be misleading because misleading, they can sometimes right. yes. overlap. Um, yep. They can overlap. Um, sometimes. Uh, well, I talked about the uh, <clears throat> the butter clam up in Washington, and they call it the uh, Washington clam. And locally, <laughs> locally, they call it the Quahog. So it's all the same plan. OK, uh, OK, shrimp. Um, we have a lot of shrimp in the bay, different kinds. Here's a couple co common ones, the Sikta Sprint shrimp, which can be anywhere from brown to bright green. Um, that's a pigment. It's not, um, but it, <clears throat> it kind of camouflages itself uh, when it uh, lives in the uh, in among the green seaweeds or in the eelgrass. There's another one called the black tail shrimp, and uh, it generally has a black tail, but not always. Usually, we have the mud shrimp and the ghost shrimp or sand shrimp. Um, the sand shrimp is probably the more common one in the bay. And they, if you're ever walking out in the bay or even uh, say at Schooner Beach, you see all these little holes um, as you get, go down towards the water and these are ghost shrimp holes or sand shrimp. And if you get out in the marshy, towards the marshy areas of the bay, the edge of the bay just uh, uh, adjacent to the salt marsh, uh, there can be dense populations of the sand shrimp out there. And you try to walk through there, they've got so many tunnels under the sand as, that the sand uh, is not stable anymore and you sink down into it. It's also um, a shrimp that uh, the oyster growers do not like because if the oysters are growing on top of the sand shrimp uh, holes, they, they can sink into the uh, sand and smother. The mud shrimp lives in muddy areas. And you tell the difference between the mud shrimp and the sand shrimp. For one thing, the sand shrimp is often, often has a pink color to it and it has one great big claw and one smaller claw. The, sand shrimp, the mud shrimp has, uh, their claws are both the same size. And also the mud shrimp may have a commensal clam that actually attaches itself to the underside of the mud shrimp. And it, often has a parasitic isopod, a crustacean. Isopods are um, what, well, you're familiar with sow bugs, uh, roly polies. That's, that's a terrestrial isopod. And this one is a parasite that lives under the carapace, the gill chamber of the uh, mud shrimp. And it is detrimental to the mud shrimp. Uh, it goes in there and sucks out its blood. We have shore crabs of different types. Uh, we have the purple shore crab. And you can tell this one by the claws that have uh, black 
they're pur kind of purplish with black spots on them. Um, the Oregon shore crab, which uh, actually has little hairs on its legs. Can't see it. Oh, yeah, you can. Well, right here, you see it. And it's very common. Uh, you'll find them under rocks, uh, especially along the uh, cobbled uh, shoreline, um, whether under rock, any kind of rocks, flat rocks, round rocks. They'll be scurrying all over the place. Then there's also the line shore crab, which is common up in the riprap along the uh, eastern shore of the bay. And you can see these lines on the uh, back of the shell on the carapace. And also, there'll be different color phases of, bo of both the short crab and the purple, both the Oregon short crab and the purple short crab. Um, sometimes they're anywhere from cream color to almost black. And then our favorite, of course, is the Dungeness crab. And the thing you should know about Dungeness crab is, besides uh, being edible and are, is the difference between the males and the females. It's a, because if you're catching crabs, you're not allowed to keep the females. Uh, so this part here is called the abdomen on the east side. And in the female, it is wide because it goes to the base of the legs on the one side to the base of the legs on the other side. Um, but by the way, these are called decapods because they have Deca means 10 and pod means feet because they have 10 feet, including the claws, 10, 10 legs. And the abdomen on the male is narrow. And in the female, this is where she carries her eggs when she's grabbing. And we have the red rock crab. Um, very common in the, in the bay, lives in rocky, mostly in rocky areas. Um, it's also good to eat, not as plentiful for the, oh, I'm going to go back to the uh, Dungeon's Crab again. Come on. Back, back, back. Um, during this time of the year, between I mean, uh, about uh, April up until about now, or maybe into August, these uh, crabs molt, and they they can only grow by shell, shedding their shell because shells don't grow. Uh, they have to sh shed their shells and grow a new one. So when they shed their shells, they climb out. They, the, the shell kind of splits in the back, and they actually climb out of the old sh shell and they have a very soft new shell, which is not calcified yet. So they hide out. They usually bury themselves in the sediment. Um, and they don't eat. So they have to get their nutrition uh, first from a, an organ called the hepatopancreas. It's on the inside of the cra crab. So the equivalent your, of your liver. And, and also, they get their nutrients from the muscle mass. They get, they get skinny because they're dieting. So when you're catching crabs in the summertime, and there's a lot of crabbing going on right now in the bay, a lot of the crabs are, the shells are soft, and there's very little meat in them. And what meat is there is pretty, pretty bad, kind of poor quality. So. If you're out crabbing and they are, um, the shells are kind of translucent um, and the animal is kind of light and doesn't weigh much, uh, it's best to put it back, even if, even though it's a large crab. It can be a legal size, uh, a large cr crab, but you're not gonna, you're not gonna find much meat in them. So, let's see, oh, the, if you're also if if you're crabbing, you can tell people this. If there's barnacles on the on the uh, exoskeleton of the crab, then you know it hasn't molted yet. So 
then it's generally full. It's just one way of quick, quickly telling whether it's a good crab or not so good. Same with the rock, red rock crab. Uh, they also molt. This one has barnacles on it, so I had molted recently. Now we do have an invasive crab, the European green crab. And it's come into the bay in the last couple of decades um, and become very prevalent. It hides out in generally rocky areas. It's a, actually a good crab to eat. It's a European import, uh, but it is competing, especially with the red rock crabs and possibly with Dungeness. Um, you can tell it be, because it has, has five spines along each side of the shell, and it's kind of a dark brown. It's also pretty. That's also uh, fairly good to eat, but please, if you catch them, don't throw them back. Couple other crabs is the, the northern kelp crab. Um, very common, usually li lives in kelpy areas. And then the uh, decorator crab, which will uh, actually take, collect seaweeds and uh, other, um, well, sometimes small animals and so on, and decorate its shell with it. So it camouflages itself that way. And you find this one, both of these. Uh, up in the, uh, pro, uh, especially around where the sargasm is in the rocky, uh, the uh, cobbled area, very common there. And this one also you find it in nail grass beds. Now, another crab that you find. Um, especially in the gaper clam, when you open the gaper clam up, almost all of them will have a little uh, crab living inside it, inside the clam. And it's sort of a parasitic, it used to be considered com commensal, which means they kind of live together, but didn't really bother each other. But this one is now considered pretty much of a a parasite because it does feed on the same food that the uh, uh, clam is feeding on. And actually, will uh, collect food that the uh, clam is uh, pumping into its uh, into its body, into its uh, the inner chamber. Actually, what happens is that when the clam a sucks in food, it's the food is collected uh, over the gills and then transported uh, along the e edge of the gills towards the mouth. And it's in these areas that the uh, clam is uh, collecting its own food. So there is usually a male and females. Uh, females are generally bigger and a lot of times they'll uh, be gravid with, with eggs, but they always live inside the inside a clam. Um, we have the porcelain crab crabs, which are very common in the in the bay, especially up in the riprap areas um, along the eastern side of the bay. I don't know how that turns so purple. That's not supposed to be purple. <laughs> it's supposed to be brown in there. I don't know what happened to that photograph uh, with some red mouth parts. Anyway, these, this is the shape. It has these kind of flat uh, claws and uh, uh, antenna, the kind of uh, stringy looking things that uh, kind of curl back over the, the back side of them. And <clears throat> it also looks like they only have eight eight legs instead of 10, but there is actually a, a, a pair of legs that are kind of tucked under that you don't really see easily. And of course we have hermit crabs. <coughs> I'm, not, I'm only gonna talk about one, which is the hairy hermit crab, the most common one. It's small and it has these 
white bands on the legs and you always tell uh, tell it. And also, if you look really carefully on the legs, right this area where I'm, my uh, pointer is, below that white area is a blue spot. And you can see that with a magnifying glass, or if your eyes are really good, you can see it without that. Uh, <coughs> and it's very common in the intertidal area of the rocky intertidal area, but also in the cobbled area and in ar around the riprap also. <coughs> One other, excuse me, a little, get a little drink of water. I talked about an isopod, remember the par parasitic isopod that was in the gills of the uh, mud shrimp. And this is the, another isopod. We have lots of isopods that live in uh, various uh, habitats, uh, especially in the rocky outer coast, but also in the bay. And I'm only gonna talk about one here that you'll find in the eelgrass because it's very common in the eelgrass. And it's usually kind of either green or, or brown. And this back end, you can always tell this one from any of the others in that this back end is concave instead of pointed outward. So this is the eelgrass isopod. Of course, we have barnacles. They're also crustaceans. Um, we have the common acorn bark barnacle, uh, the one that lives high up in the uh, intertidal zone, and then lower in the intertidal zone, we have um, the thatched acorn barnacle. And it's called thatched because it looks like a thatched roof, all these little uh, ridges coming down the sides of the shell. And it is a crustacean because it, it's lives inside this hole and it has four little doors that can cover the hole. And when it's underwater, it will open those doors and essentially it's it's extends its feet out the door. His feet are called Siri. And uh, it sweeps the water for any kind of food that's drifting by. Okay, now the echinoderms. The... Jim, we have a couple crustacean questions. Can I throw okay. those at you real quick? Okay, sure. Um, one was about um, crabs when they're molting. So it says, do people who crab at this time of year typically not know or just not care about it being soft and skinny? That's true. They either don't know or they don't care. <laughs> and both. I have heard... <laughs> I've heard people talk about getting crabs that and were surprised about the lack of content inside. So, uh -huh. um, yeah, I definitely think it's a little bit of both. So, and uh, um, I talked to a, a crabber one time who said, Oh, if they molt, they still have the same amount of, because of me inside just means they're larger. <laughs> I said, well, no, that's not true. <laughs> As we had an argument. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> the, this is actually a really good question. Um, what's the significance of the blue spot on the hairy hermit crab? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question, though. I, I it like is it. That's a good question. I, I don't know what, why it has a blue spot there, but that's one of the key characteristics of that particular hermit crab. Is that it's interesting. Spot. I know, and Michael. What, I don't, I don't, what does it do? I don't know. I wonder. I it was Michael that asked knows. that question? But I wonder if you're thinking about the gull's red dot on its beak, so that it gets pecked to feed. You know, the little ones get pecked to feed. <laughs> that would be really great to find out if that's what happens with the hermit crab as some kind of. <laughs> I'm going back to that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah, it's interesting though. It is. Good question. It is a good question. I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that. Okay, echinoderms. Echino means spiny skin. 
kind of derm means spiny skin. It kind of means spiny derm's skin. And all of these have some kind of spines on them. We have the uh, sea stars or starfish. They're pretty much called sea stars anymore. I used to, I learned them as starfish, so I call them, still call them starfish. Um, this is our most common one, the uh, ochre star. And you'll see these mostly on uh, in the rocky intertidal areas, uh, out like in the ocean side, but also uh, in the riprap along the side of the bay and along the uh, the <clears throat> boat launch in the marina right there. And they hang onto the rocks with their tube feet. Um, now, you might remember that um, back about uh, 2013, we had a, a disease called the waste, uh, star, the sea star wasting disease that uh, devastated uh, sea stars all the way from Alaska down to Mexico. So, and the ochre star was affected. It is coming back now. It's doing pretty well, but some of the other sea stars are still having uh, trouble. The cause of the disease was poss possibly a virus, but there have been um, so. Also, it could have been something bacterial, um, and nobody's really sure. I just read something on it the, uh, this morning on the news because, uh, and this is the pink uh, sea star. It is coming back in the bay. You'll find this one, uh, especially ar around the, uh, well, the cobbled area and just below below knee tarts and in around the, uh, especially in the areas where there's uh, lots of seaweed, it's coming back. It's not as common as it used to be. And this is the one that has, was hit the hardest. This is the sunflower star. It can I have up to 24 arms. It's the world's largest sea star. It can be, up to three feet across. Um, it has virtually disappeared in most areas along, along the coast. In some places, it was almost 100%, or was 100%. There was one found recently in Neetarts Bay by um, Marcus, the owner of uh, Kayak. Tillamook County, they actually found the one in Neetarts Bay, and that's a good sign. Um, there, <clears throat> up at Friday Harbor, there is a scientist that is actually raising these sea stars now and getting them to survive so they can be replanted. The result of the <clears throat> of losing these sea stars has been areas of coast, especially in California, its favorite, its favorite food was the purple sea urchin. And it would actually ingest the purple sea urchin, uh, eat it whole, which is a little different uh, way of uh, feeding than some, say the ochre star, which diverts its stomach and feeds mostly on mussels. <clears throat> but where it uh, is absent, and this was, this was an apex predator, it's a keystone predator, keystone species. So once it disappears, the whole environment changes. And so the purple uh, sea urchin, which we have around here, but it's not uh, real common, but it, in certain parts of California and Southern Oregon, uh, it's reproduced so, so much that there are um, what are called um, purple urchin deserts. They are nothing but purple urchins. And the urchins fed on kelp, uh, bull kelp and uh, other large brown kelps. 
and those kelps have disappeared and the kelp, some of the kelp forests have disappeared and it's nothing but uh, purple sea urchins on the bottom. And this has happened, I, I think up in Washington and some places in Alaska also. This is, a, so I, of course I took this picture before we had that disease. This was a small uh, sunflower star and you see it has lots of tube feet, tens of thousands of them. And it's actually can move fairly fast. Okay, here's a model star. Um, it can be in various co colors, um, but it does have patchy dark areas and patchy light areas. And then our favorite, the, the Western sand dollar. Um, we take there are live sand dollars in the bay. Uh, there's a sand dollar bed uh, over on the west side of the bay that uh, where there's some high concentrations of adult sand dollars, but also there you can find uh, sand dollars in various parts of the sandy areas of the bay. Not where there's a whole lot of current, but there there has to be some because they feed by um, trapping um, detritus as it flows by them. And it, and the, the sand dollars will kind of go up on the edge where they can actually uh, trap trap their food. And what you find on a ocean beach is their um, skeleton. The shell has these uh, little, little flower-like patterns on the uh, dorsal side. And these are called ambulacra. That's where some of the gills uh, will come through the holes in that through holes in along that pattern. And on the underside, there's a, a mouth right in the center. And then <clears throat> juveniles, like this one was only about a, a millimeter or a centimeter and a half across. And these are very common in the bay. And very often we'll take people over to the sand, when we did the kayak tours, we'll take people over to the sand dollar bed so they can see land, land, live sand dollars. Another kind of derm is the uh, sea cucumber. Um, the one we have two of them in the bay, two common ones. Uh, this one's intertidal, kind of lower intertidal, and you can find it in the riprap right around the boat ramp, and pretty common there. And, and it has these bright orange tentacles, and then they retract. They can retract their tentacles and they live down in the crevices between the rocks. And these can be about, um, oh, six or eight inches long. But we have also the giant California uh, sea cucumber, which can be more than a foot long. And those are subtitled pretty much. Um, and we collect those for the kids to uh, handle. Because when you do handle them, they have a, a peculiar defense mechanism. They, <clears throat> they breathe by, by um, ingesting, um, pumping water through their body, and they have these filamentous gills called respiratory, respiratory uh, trees. And when they're handled or disturbed too much, they will actually eject their respiratory trees right, right through their anus. And it comes, they just come spewing out uh, in this kind of stringy mass. And then they, <clears throat> they will actually regenerate new, uh, new gills. So this one little girl holding one in her <laughs> that we collected in a bucket. We have another sea a burrowing sea cucumber in the bay. It's not very common, but you find it occasionally called the rat tail sea cucumber. And it's uh, one that ingests sand grains. And again, it's like it does that because it 
uh, will collect any of the uh, living things, the bacteria, the diatoms, anything like that that's, that's adhering to the uh, sand grains. Okay, uh, anything, anything about uh, mollusk or um, echinoderms or anything? Um, there are some questions that didn't have to quite do with those. Um, there's a question about what the clear, more of a crustacean, the clear little scavengers that feed on dead animals on the shoreline that also bite people. <laughs> those are the amphipods, the, the beach fleas. Let's go back to that one. Uh, okay. Um, back to that. A little bit further, I think. Yeah. Right. There it is. Yeah. That's the beach flea. We have a couple, there are a couple of species of uh, beach fleas. Yeah. Actually, and lots of species of amphipods. Most amphipods are uh, um, more, aqua uh, more aquatic. Uh, but they safe. do they do certainly swarm around the eelgrass and then if a, a crab is washed up dead they will certainly yeah. be in yeah. masses there <laughs> they, and they do bite you uh yeah a lot of these are vegetarians they will see they'll eat uh you'll see them uh around drift, uh algae uh, seaweeds that are drifted up on the beach uh and, and as you say they can they'll uh eat dead crabs, and yes, they will bite you. <laughs> so <laughs> if you're wading through a, a, a pool, uh, say out over an ocean side on the beach, and you can feel this nibbling on your feet, that's what it is, the beach fleas. <laughs> All right. Um, Jim, just as a time check, we're at 4.50, so we're about 10 minutes left on our scheduled OK, timing. we're about done, so, actually. Awesome. Uh, Okay, bryozoans. Well, I'm going to link. These are called bryo, means moss, zoans, animals. And I'm only going to talk about one. They're, most of these are encrusting, but not all of them. The ones we have in the bay, uh, you'll see encrusting on rocks. And it's actually a colony of the animals. And let me go back to slideshow. That is a single individual, a diagram of it. And here is a colony called uh, Membranopora. And you'll see these patterns sometimes on rocks. And this particular species lives mostly on uh, big leafy brown algae. And they See, live in, they secrete a, usually a siliceous or sometimes a calcareous uh, little chamber. And each of these animals, they have tentacles. And each animal is called a zoid. And they live in these colonies and they feed it mostly on, um, they trap detritus and other very, very small, say, uh, larva for, from uh, other animals that are become part of the plankton. So, and this is what they look like when they're undisturbed. When they're disturbed, they're all tucked back down inside their little chamber. So when you see this pat pattern, it's a, it's a bryozoan, moss animal. And tunicates is the last one. And only we have numerous tunicates. Now tunicates are a peculiar type of animal. Um, they feed on their suspension feeders. In other words, they uh, feed on anything that's suspended in the water. They suck water into a uh, gill chamber or pharynx. It has these gill slits, 
and then the, the water flows out when well, this is where they capture their food. And so they have it, an intake uh, channel and an excurrent channel. And the common one we have around here that you'll find mostly up in the um, rocky and um, not the rocky, uh, cobble area around uh, the Terry Moore and uh, Neetart. Um, this is the stock tunicate. Now the tunicate is fairly high up on the evolutionary scale because its larva has what's called a notochord, which is a precursor to a backbone. So they are in the phylum urochordates, which includes us. So we're in the same phylum as this critter. I think that's about it. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. Um, we did have a couple more questions come in. Um, one was, uh, what was a pretty good question. What was the scale or the diameter of the bryozoan colony? They can be... That particular one was probably an inch, an inch and a half in diameter. And they can be fairly large or can be fairly small, depending on the size of the colony. And there are a lot of species of uh, bryozoans. They are extremely hard to identify. Uh, they're excess. This silicious, silicious uh, skeleton can, ha can have all kinds of different uh, patterns on them, but they're really hard to uh, key out. You almost have to, I think most of the people who do study bryozoans use scanning electron microscopes to and I don't have any really good keys for uh, identification guides for uh, bryozoans. I got one that's, uh, oh, name's probably a couple of dozen, but it's, uh, I look at the ones we have around here and I can't tell <laughs> from their pictures what they are. But I do know this one also because it has these little things at the corners of their cell little donut shaped things. That's These are great pictures. They're super fascinating to see it that close. I mean, you see the speckled um, one from the left a lot, uh, but it's cool to see it kind of blown up like this to look at it. Uh, yeah, I have, I have, question. My, oh, yeah, I have my microscopes here at home. So I take pictures through the microscopes. <laughs> yeah. That's what that's what's behind Jim covered up in plastic. It's just multiple microscopes. Oh, um, <laughs> so oh. I have I have a question from earlier. It actually has to do with sand movement that I missed. Um, with the northward movement of the sand, what is the probability of a permanent breach of the spit at the campground area? Uh, it would probably come from the. <clears throat> Uh, south, yeah, okay, northward movement, movement of the sand. Actually, let's go back to um, an early slide. This one right here. This is at the narrow, narrowest point on the spit. And the likelihood of a breach is probably pretty good. During a, if the, we had a, a huge storm with big waves coming over uh, the sand berm right here. Uh, in fact, state parks, uh, Bill Gammy, uh notified state parks um, a year ago that there may have been, that they were almost expecting a breach last winter. It didn't happen, um, but some of this area right in here used to be part of the drain field for the uh, state park that washed away. So 
this, this beach area is getting closer and closer to the salt marsh, which is over here. That answer the question? I think it's, yeah, I think it's, that's... it's, uh, it's likely. Yeah. Yeah, it does definitely seem to be the case. And the park's making plans now to deal with it. So they are. that suggests the likelihood that, is even that very may, strong. Uh, change the whole character of the salt marsh and the back side of the, the south side of the bay. I have one, I have another question that just came in. Um, uh, we get a lot of prior zones. They are a tunicate. Do they have the in-water valve and the outwater valve? Also, yes. are we related to them, similar to the tuna kit you showed us in the slide? Uh, yes, we are related to them. They have, they have a, their larva does co uh, contain a nitocord. And yes, they do have the two uh, um, inlet intake and out, outgoing uh, channels. And the pyrosome is actually a colony of uh, tunicate zoids. Now the, the pyrosomes uh, occur, occur here oh, on occasion, but um, more recently because of the uh, warming waters. Um, they're more of the tropical species. Um, found in uh, warm, warmer waters to the south of us, but sometimes they'll drift up, up this far north. And as of course, a few years ago, we had the beaches full of them. Okay. That's great. Um, if there's any last minute questions, um, let me, let us know. Um, I see some thanks coming in and some needs to sign off. Um, I will um, just kind of put my my screen back up here for a second. I'm going to take over. <laughs> um, just as a reminder that um, we are um, kind of pausing our programs right now, and we will we are reassessing it frequently to see when we feel like it's the best time to get back to them. That said, um, we are working to try and move some of our, what we thought would be in-person content virtual. And if we can, we'll certainly get that word out to you. Um, then finally, I will follow this up with um, a email that has a, a version of Jim's presentation with notes available so that you can um, kind of get that content and have it available to you. And then I will also um, include a document that has all the links I shared so that you guys can um, can review them and don't have to worry about grabbing them from the chat before you go. So um, you can be looking for that over the next couple of days. Um, but we thank you for contacting us. Um, and um, let us know uh, if you have any more questions pop up into your brains. You can always email them to, to myself. I can forward them to Jim and we can get those things answered for you. Um, and then to sign off, John, John shared a very good point, which is that, um, that perhaps not everybody knows that not only is Jim a, a, a scientist and a great resource for us, but he's also an artist. Um, and apparently John just acquired one of your artists, one of your drawings. Oh. Did you yeah, know that? I don't make many drawings, but <laughs> a few now and then. <laughs> it's true. And he also uh, sells photographs usually at the market and they're around in different, in different parts of the town, but also that the, his skills with photography also make our online resources extra good because he's um, been able to capture such great great stuff. So, um, Thank you. yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, we want to sign off here. I hope you have a, a wonderful dinner and the wonderful rest of your evening. And thank you so much for giving us your time. We hope that you found it interesting and worthwhile and that it's giving you some of the information you were looking for. Um, if anybody has questions about volunteer opportunities, just reach out. And I certainly will include Roger, Roger Miller, who couldn't join us today. He's our volunteer coordinator. I'll include his contact information in the information I send out to you, to you all. We appreciate our volunteers. We really do. And we hope that these um, feel good to you. So we're trying to keep going 
to keep doing them uh, at least at least every six months to a year so that we have some content so for you all all right well good night thanks again jim okay thank you good night everybody, good night, everybody. okay <laughs>